Jomo Frey, cinematographer for Nickel Boys, one of the most, if not the most innovative films of the year with the first person POV. Uh, what was that first conversation like with Ramel Ross uh, discussing this technique? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was, it was a conversation where Ramel and I, even in our first conversations, we're trying to figure out what is, what is point of view? What is first person? And, you know, pretty quickly on, we started using the term sentient perspective instead of saying POV almost as a way to ground us in what I think Ramel was after was trying to think of an image that always felt connected to a human body, always felt like it was tied in a very present tense way to a, a real person navigating an often hostile environment. So it, it was one of those situations where even from the onset, it's like, okay, well, if we do want to do this sentient perspective, this first person perspective, um, how do we find more traditional film grammar? What does that mean in this visual style? What's an establishing shot? What's a cut? What's a transition? How do we move through space? How do we move through time? So, you know, there was a way in which for us, even though from our very first conversation, Rumel said he wanted to do first person, it was really then trying to build and think about film at an almost subatomic level of, okay, well, what are the, the parts and pieces that make up what we understand as an establishing shot? And how can we still rebuild those concepts and take those traditional film concepts and make them work within this perspective that we were after? Mm -hmm. And I know you guys came up with a very meticulous shot list to accomplish that. But I think at the same time, when you're watching the film, you might also not even tell that you guys did that because everything feels so fluid and free flowing. Just it feels like, you know, you are like the camera, you're you're the camera, you're watching like the leaves and the trees. And so what, what was it like coming up that shot list and then actually executing it and make sure things feel natural? Yeah, it was a really incredible process. And so in the shot list, we were almost thinking about the edit and thinking about every aspect of making the film holistically. And at, even at that point, Ramel had gathered all of the archival footage. So there was a way in which we were really trying to just build the movie together from scratch. And we were really, as you were saying, meticulous in how we kind of would lay out every single shot and every single scene we designed as a one -er, as a shot, even though we knew we were going to cut, we still wanted the actors to be able to stay in flow and to kind of eliminate some aspects of artifice if we can get around them. But, you know, it, it was really about trying to have that kind of level of preparation so that on the day and on set, we could actually have a more improvisational feel and a more jazz-like feel. Um, so it was really doing that preparation so that when we kind of got there, we could find the shot. And, and it was a situation with, because of the sentient perspective and the gaze, it it's important to have a sense of wonderment. It's important to have a sense that the image itself is never in front of any action that's happening, which sounds simple, but it weirdly, you have to kind of retrain yourself as an operator and moving the camera. Um, because we would always have this anecdote that in traditional cinema, you know, the shot is the a ground and then a glass comes in and it shatters. In our movie, the shot is looking somewhere, you hear a glass shatter, and then the camera has to swing to where the sound was but you're always behind the action happening. And we would kind of remind ourselves of that each day to kind of orient ourselves to that. But, but yeah, no, I, I think it was, um, it was fun finding those things and yeah. fun kind of trying to inject some of the poetry into it. And our production designer, Nora Mendes, would start every day showing us like, okay, these are 10 hero items in the room that you can interact with three of them, you can act with, Five of them, you can interact with none of them, but they're just anchor points in the scene and in the set so that over the course of a take, we would try to do different takes almost every single take to just stay in the world and the emotion of the take each time we were doing it to kind of bring in some more of that kind of poetic, organic language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys, I feel like you guys did that really well, just reacting to things that are happening or just how a human being would react to a uh, certain news. Cause there's so many points that uh, there's a lot of bad news in this movie, but it's like, when you, when you get bad news, you might not be comfortable looking at that person delivering the news. So your, your drift gazes and then like the camera has to shift that way too. So what was it like for you? Like trying to mimic that human movement with the camera, like your eyes would be here if you're looking right, you know? Absolutely. You know, it was, it was really, 
wonderful. So basically every scene would start with Rommel rehearsing with the actors and I would usually be nearby kind of watching them and particularly watching Ethan and Brandon, the two actors that played Elwood and Turner, and just seeing how they move, seeing where their gaze went. And then in the scene, whether it was me or our camera operator, Sam Ellison, it was kind of about imbuing and mimicking the emotions we saw in their performance and trying to kind of imbue the camera with that kind of vulnerability, that kind of presence that the characters have, which makes it where something Rebel was always talking about is he didn't want the movie to merely capture how we see, but to capture how it feels to see, which I think gets at your question where it's, it's not actually about seeing, it's about how does the human heart see the world? Where do you look when you hear bad news? Where do you look when you are looking at a crush for the first time? Where does your gaze go in the case of this movie that takes place in the Jim Crow South? If you're a black boy walking down the street, there's a white couple coming towards you, you get off of the sidewalk, but where do your eyes go? Does it go down to your shoes? Does it look at their shoes to kind of gauge the socioeconomics of their status? Do you look them in the eye? Do you not look them in the eye? Do you look ahead? Kind of for us, it was really about asking the questions of where does a person's gaze and where does a person's look reside when you're kind of, again, navigating a very hostile world around you. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, for you as your job normally, you know, you're you're capturing the actors. But in this film, like you, you're part of the scene, like you have to be like an actor too and you know mimic them and I'm thinking of like the scene when Turner hugs Anjanu I mean you do multiple times like what was that like like you have to get into her and to hug her and to make that look realistic yeah you know even in the shot listing phase where Mel and I would have a DSLR and we just practice certain things in the movie and be like oh does this feel right now I don't know it should be a little higher up and maybe that's something in there where, you know, the audience has incredible amount of visual literacy being inside of their own body. So there's a way in which like genuinely some shots can be a centimeter off and it feels uncanny. And so we were always kind of working around that. But in terms of the question of working with actors in that way, it was, it was really phenomenal. There's a way in which I think the image changes and, or at least to compose an image as a cinematographer changes when quite literally the image is hugging the actor and you're physically hugging them. You're making a connection. There's a physical intimacy there. There's a connection that's there that hopefully comes through in the image, but it kind of changes how you shoot. You know, I, I always try to think of the ways in which sometimes you can tell an image that was shot by a lover or shot by a friend. It has a quality to it. There's both a quality from the subject that they're willing to be vulnerable and give something that they may not in a more traditional image. And there's also a way in which I think you can oftentimes see the love in how they're captured, where the camera is, how it's framing them. And I think that this movie was a situation to get inside of the emotional life of Turner and Elwood. You had to see the world as Turner and Elwood. Uh, you had to see the world as Turner and Elwood. And when you're seeing Hattie and you're seeing Anjanu, there's there's a deep love there that, you know, more traditionally in cinematography, I'm often maybe imbuing the image with the emotion of the character, but this felt different because I had to have it in my body. And yeah, there, there was just something really powerful in that relationship. And I'm just so grateful for the actors also welcoming me into their space because, you know, the way the camera moves, you are a scene partner, you have to be present to them. And there were, there was an instance early on on set on Anjanu's first day when she was sitting at a table and she was delivering bad news to Elwood. And there's this moment right before she's about to kind of say what she's saying and she's building up to it. And, you know, I watched Ethan rehearse the scene and I was also thinking about it as Jomo and thinking, you know, it's really hard making eye contact with someone when you know they're giving you news that's devastating them to have to deliver. And so as Jomo and as the gaze of Elwood, you know, I kind of drifted away. And there was this moment in there where Anjanu paused and she just put her hand out across the table and she said, Elwood, look at me, son. And the camera is forced to drift back. It's forced to make and maintain was, her Was gaze. that like an improv by her? It wasn't. It that was... wasn't improv by her. That was totally off the mm -hmm. script. So and you were not it was, prepared for that. <laughs> was not prepared for that. And I think that there was this moment that, you know, I'm honestly getting a bit of goosebumps thinking about it where 
when the camera reestablishes and looks at her and she looks out of her lens and she says that, I remember when, you know, Ramel said cut and I ran to the monitor to see him and, and we were both like vibrating. We're like, that's it. Like, that's actually why this perspective is so different and exciting is that it actually is inside. It isn't just that it's inside the scene. It's that the image itself can change based on how the actors around it are moving. The image has to kind of be inside the scene. It has to truly be locked into being a scene partner. And there was something in that that I think was exciting for us because I don't think either of us had ever seen an image like that. And again, the gesture of turning back wasn't written. And then when the you script, turn back, it it's not going to be perfect either. It'd be like, uh, like I have to, you know, control myself. And like, do totally. I actually want to look in your eyes? You know, like- totally. Totally. There's a way in which it, it, after that moment, I think we completely started shooting in a different way because it was about the camera has to be vulnerable. The camera has to hold the uncertainty of life, the uncertainty of any given moment. And I think that that really, yeah, I, I don't think I had ever experienced something like that as an image maker and seeing that just kind of changed it. But again, you know, on almost all the shots, the actor who is the perspective would often be very close to me, um, physically kind of putting their hands, putting different their legs in. I had their costume on in case I had to look down, you could see their body as my body. Um, and, you know, there were also scenes where we shot with systems like the Snorri cam, which is basically a metal chassis around the actor with poles going out the back to a camera block. And in those instances, you know, there, there was a real kind of co-authorship and co-cross-pollination that was constantly happening because, you know, a cinematographer, me and our operator, Sam Allison, were kind of having to imbue ourselves with the emotion, almost be an actor inside the scene. And then in situations like the Snorri cam, when it's just attached to the actor's body, I remember talking to Davi Diggs, the actor who plays the older Elwood, and he and I looking at an image and kind of talking emotionally about it. He's like, okay, yeah. So like when he comes in, you know, I'm trying to make a connection. So maybe I open up the right side of my, sh of my chest. So kind of compositionally he comes into the shot. And when I feel that I'm thinking with more interiority, maybe I close down the right side of my, my shoulder, which kind of pulls him out of the composition. And I was like, yeah, like go, go with those yeah. instincts. And like, <laughs> you know, there's something that was really exciting to Ramel and I in terms of having some of those aspects of kind of cross-pollination and cross, like co-authorship yeah. in it. I mean, it, it looks amazing. Uh, well, Jomo, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll see you back here in a little bit. Thank you.